L'chaim, yes. L'chaim. L'chaim, Shalom. Okay, well, we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, um, tonight's sponsors Aham of the Lighthouse. In honor of the people that work so hard to keep the Lighthouse project running week in and week out, dedicated anonymously. So this is basically like saying that whoever it is that thinks that the hardworking, dedicated people of the Lighthouse should be honored does not want you to know who he is because he is embarrassed. Or she. Or she, that's true. Or they. I mean, I don't really know all the pronouns anymore. It's very confusing. And also, for the Rafu Shalimov, Ben Achimeno, Ben Sarabacha, and Deborah Fega, Bot Razel, and I gotta say, it's good to be back. It really is. It's good to be back. It's great to be back. Um, I was, uh, as you probably know, I was, in, I was in Israel. I was in the Holy Land for uh, nearly three weeks. We bar mitzvahed my second son. Which was awesome. Thank you very much. And then, uh, yeah, that was that was super cool, super super cool. And and then my sister-in-law, my wow, Sita Young. And then um, my second to last sister-in-law got married the next week. So that's sister number seven for Yael, and then four brothers. So that's a heck of a family. And it was just, it was amazing. It was amazing. And you know what the funny part was. So um, we, did, we did the Shabbos for the Bar Mitzvah in Beit Shemesh, and we needed a place that was large enough to accommodate what, thank God, is a very large tribe. It's a very large tribe because my wife is one of 13, and between her family and all of their children and my family that came in, it was, it was really uh, it was beautiful. And, and we rented the shul so that we could, have, we could have the Bar Mitzvah there. And I, oh, wow, wow, unbelievable. I was so happy. Can't see you in Israel, but I could see you in Miami, baby. Uh, I don't know who that would be. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no earthly clue of who you speak. Um, so I'm in a room with with 80 Israelis, with 80 Israelis. Okay, I'm at 80 of him. <laughs> Just like imagine that. All right, which already is difficult. <laughs> it's already a hard thing to, to put up with. And and, I, and I'm trying to to express to them how they have no freaking idea what it means to stand in Israel. They don't know what it means, because they exist there, you know? So for a fish, water isn't water, water is the world. A fish exists in water. That's not water, that's the world. If you grew up in Israel and you've never been in an airplane in your life, then what do you mean? Of course, Jews live in Israel, but I'm a gringo. I'm a gringo, and, and I'm a major fan of history, because I believe that history has nothing to do with yesterday. History is today, history is the whole story. So for me to be able to like make a bar mitzvah for my son in Israel and stand there, and stand there, it was so meaningful. And, and I didn't feel like it was just me. I didn't feel like it was just me. I felt like, like the Jewish nation, you know? It was really weird and it was rather surreal, but awesome. So I think that was probably like the most, the most moving part. I mean, the food was good and the camaraderie was great and all that stuff was great and he leaned well and he did all that stuff. But, it was, uh, it was super cool. And then, and then, despite the fact that whenever you leave Israel, there's a little bit of a letdown, because there, there naturally is a little bit of a letdown when you leave you know, the land that is most holy. But I have to say that, um, thank God we are so blessed because we came home to Miami, and it's Miami, <laughs> you know? It's not like I didn't go from Israel to Chicago <laughs> or, Canada or Serbia. I, yeah, I came to Miami. So I loved being in Israel. And I also, I, I love Miami. You know, I love home. So it was just wonderful. It was wonderful all around. And, and we're, we're so very, very blessed. And it's good to, to concentrate on that, you know, to really to, to take into account how blessed we are as human beings. And that's just I tremendous. Hashem loves me. That's true. He does. Man. He, loves, he loves all of us. He, he really, really does. It's just sometimes it's a little bit more easy to see uh, than other times. Okay, so today, today's uh, topic is what actually is the point of Judaism? I have my trusty notes here in case I get lost. Um, th what, is the, what is the point of Judaism? I'll tell you why it is that I wanted to talk about this. You know, I love meat. Hey, who doesn't love meat? Right? Even vegetarians, they love meat. They just don't eat it. Yeah, but they love it. I love meat. And I love cheese. I love cheese. I can do the mental math in my head, okay? I know that a cheeseburger would be, like, amazing. Of course it would be amazing. But I'm not eating it because of the whole Judaism thing, right? Because of Judaism. 
And I love Shabbat. Don't get me wrong. Shabbat is wonderful. But it would be nice to go to a movie premiere every once in a while. Right? So Judaism is very restrictive. It's very restrictive. In fact, of all the religions that you can find out there, I would, I would place a very, very heavy bet that a mitzvah observant Jew is far and away more restricted than any other layman. I'm not saying that you can't have a priest with like chastity vows and poverty vows and a monk who's on a silence vow and all that stuff, fine. But that's not the religion, that's a specific individual within the religion. We have a very, very restrictive religion, and I would like to know, like, what's the point of this? What, what's, what's the objective in this whole thing? What's the, how do you win? How do you win Judaism? Why, why are we doing this? I, I, it's a very basic question. Why? What's the point? Right? What? Right? What's the point? And like, I, no one ever asked the question. <laughs> but seriously, what's the freaking point? Um, now, th there are so many different ways that you can go with this. So I was, I was discussing this with a colleague of mine today in the school. And, uh, and she says to me, um, Oh, wow, Sam, that's amazing. That's amazing. Unbelievable. You have really, really good Wi-Fi on that airplane, I gotta tell you. <laughs> so, so I was talking to, uh, to, about this with a colleague today, and she says to me, she's like, what do you mean? There's no point. How can there not be a point? Why am I doing this if there's no point? If there's, dude, if there's no point, I really want a cheeseburger now. Stat. Stat. And that's not the only thing I want. Okay? That is not the only thing I want. I want a lot, and I want it now. I want less of certain things, and I want more of other things, and I want other things that I've never had before, and I want it now. And there better be a point. Now, this is not to say, this is not to say that within the next, uh, you know, uh, four hours that this class is going to take, that we're going, we're going to completely exhaust every element of Judaism. Obviously, we're not going to do that. I'm not looking for details upon details and layers upon layers upon layers. I'm looking at some sort of a coherent and cohesive vision some overarching idea that encompasses the whole. That's what I'm looking for. I would like to, I would like to have uh, at least something. Could, could you please put it a little closer? Because I don't think they can see all of my nose hairs. Like, maybe if we could just... It doesn't look like that. No, it doesn't look like that? Okay, because from here it looks terrible. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. Nobody's, nobody watches me because I'm good looking, that's for sure. Um, so it's, it's the voice. It's all the voice. Feel that timber? That's why they listen. Okay, um, so so let's let's <laughs> see. I told you. Um, yeah, very good. So in order to in order to properly identify what the what the point of Judaism is, we're going to have to reiterate something that we've spoken about before, very very briefly. Um, in order to know what the point of Judaism is, you have to have a definition for Judaism, right? If you don't have an operative definition for Judaism then you can't possibly figure out what the point of it is because you haven't contained what it is. So first you have to see what it is and then you can determine why. Understand? The definition is the what and the purpose is the why. If you don't know what the what is, you will never find the why. So that's another question that Jews very, very infrequently ask themselves and other people, which is that what is Judaism? Can you define it, please? And people say all sorts of things like, oh, well, you know, it's a monotheistic religion and it involves, you know, circumcision and Shabbat and kashrut and Tarah and Mishpacha and all the... That's not Judaism. None of those features are Judaism. They are descriptions of Judaism. They are facets of Judaism. They're pieces of Judaism, but they're not Judaism. That's the definition of Judaism. The definition of a definition, obviously, is that anything that is, is, and anything that is not, is not. Most Jews don't have an operative definition for, the, for Judaism. So um, anyone who wants to look at the exhaustive... Uh, speech on this, I think it's in the archives. You can go on the Facebook and look at the archives and you can have an hour of developing the thought. But basically, it's not all that difficult. It's really not. It's really not. Um, people make the mistake. They doom themselves by thinking that Judaism is a religion, which, of course, it's not. Obviously, it's not. Why do I say it's obviously not a religion? Simple. A religion is a belief system. Correct? A system of belief. That is your religion. Your system of belief. Some systems of belief involve God. Some systems of belief involve numerous gods. Some systems of belief involve no gods, your God. But at the end of the day, your religion is your belief system. An organized religion is when everybody has the same system. And a disorganized religion is when you decide what your system is going to be. But trust me, atheists are every bit as religious as you and I. Yes, they just have a different God, the God in the mirror. So, there is no belief in Judaism that makes you a Jew if you're not. And there's no lack of belief in Judaism that makes you not a Jew if you are. Let's go over that again. 
Bobby Fischer maintained till the day that he died that he was not Jewish. Guess what? Yamod Baruch Mendel Ben Right. We don't care what he says about his Judaism. We, we couldn't care a hoot. We couldn't care a lick. It doesn't matter. But, but I don't even believe in God. That's wonderful, Bobby. Now, would you come for Shabbos, please? But I don't wear tzitzis. That's wonderful. Now, please make hamotzi. Really, I'm hungry. But I don't keep kosher. That's fine. Make the blessing and come on. Why? Why? If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, I have news for you. You are not a Christian. But my parents are Christian. That's wonderful. Your parents are Christian and you are not. Your parents are Christian and you're a Yankee fan. And if your parents are atheists and you do believe in Christ, guess what? You're a Christian. Because that's a religion. Same with Islam. Doesn't apply to Judaism, does it? No. Well, why not? Because it's not religion. Well, it's not a religion, then what is it? Well, I don't know, like, what, what, what does the book say? What, what, what does the book say it is? A nation. Like, this is, it, it, it tickles me because it's, it's, it's hysterical. It's not actually a hard question. It's only a hard question because we have these stupid preconceived notions drilled into our minds. So once we know and take it as a default that it's a religion, you can never think your way out of that box. But if you read the book, you would never come away thinking that it's a religion. Because the Torah, first of all, does not have a word for religion. Doesn't have a word for it, number one. Number two, what are the two words that the Torah calls us all the time? Um and goy. What do those words mean? Nation. Nation! Boom! You're a nation! You're a nation of Jews. That's it. Judaism is a nation. Now, what are the parameters of said nation? So I like to look at a very, very simple analogy for this. Um, and again, if you want the whole unzipped version, you're, you're welcome to, to listen to that here. But it's very similar to the American Constitution. Everything in this country has to fit into one document, the Constitution. If it fits into the document, it can be law. If it fits into the document, you can have it in the culture. And if it doesn't fit into the document, it can't be the law and it can't be the culture. That's the Constitution. Judaism is defined by the parameters of the Torah, period. Period. That's it. Now, you could have Jews who eat gefilte fish, and Jews who eat dagma Kai, and Jews who are Ashkenazi, and Jews who are Sephardi, and Jews who are Buddhist, and Jews who are atheists. You could have all those things. Just like you can have an American who hates the Constitution and doesn't agree that the, the state trooper has a right to pull him over. You can think whatever you want, but the people who created this nation said that these parameters are going to define the way that we act in this country. That's it. It's very simple. So Judaism, in one word, if you want to know the definition of it, is Torah. That's it. That's really all it is. <coughs> Sad, I know. Sad. But that's all it is. It's just Torah. So if that's the case, then we have to kind of tweak our question and not ask so much, what's the point of Judaism, but rather, what's the point of Torah? What's the objective in Torah? What, what do you win when you're done? What do you get? What's the point? So when you ask people this question, if you ask people this question, I suggest to you because it's a lot of fun, um, you, get, you get, you know, thoughts like, well, um, immorality. The Torah is about morality. Really? Really? Is the Torah about morality? Are you telling me that um, people who aren't Jewish, don't, they're, they're immoral? Yeah, people who aren't Jewish, they're immoral. No, no, they're not. I mean, some are. <laughs> Plenty of Jews are immoral, right? The Torah is not there for your morality. Every human being on the planet Earth has to have what you and I consider morality. We can get into the definitions of morality, subjective versus objective, that's true. But in terms of like what we would consider general societal morality, universal values, the Christians and the Muslims and the atheists and the Buddhists are every bit as moral as we consider ourselves to be. It doesn't seem to be the case that you should restrict morality to Jews. Uh, yeah, but maybe it's about holiness. Torah is there um, for holiness. Well... There, there is a commandment to be holy. There is, in fact, a commandment to be holy. I say a commandment as opposed to the commandment or as opposed to all the commandments because it's a commandment. It's one of 613 commandments. Thou shalt be holy, Kiddushin to you. So holiness definitely comes under the umbrella of Judaism, but it's certainly not the point of the Torah because it's one. It's one. It's 
mitzvah. One mitzvah. Say mezuzah is the point of the Torah. Why? Because the Torah says you got to put a mezuzah on the door. That's the point. There you go. Of the, no, that's not the point. That is a point. It's not the point. It's a holiness. Maybe, maybe it's worship. It's worship. We're here to serve Hashem. I got, I got a lot of that in school. I got a lot of that in school. Hashem put us here to serve Him. You know why he did that? Because he's very bored. He's very bored. And not only is he bored, he's got, you know, a little bit of a self-confidence problem. You know, Hashem has a self-confidence issue, but he's working on it. He's been working on it for 16 billion years, and the best tool that he has found is by creating these little tiny ants to bow down to him all the time. And that makes him feel good. And that makes him validated and happy. And the point of Torah, therefore, is worship. Because God wants us to have this beautiful big building and slaughter animals and throw their blood at the wall and then put the animal on the grill and that, somehow, God gets off on that. Is that the point of Judaism? I really hope not. For so very many reasons. I mean, first of all, it, 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 it's patently not the case. It's patently not the case because you see in the prophets where God says, me be case of me, Kim. Which means, who even asked you? Who asked you to give me these, these stupid offerings, you tramplers, right? You tramplers, you trespassers of my living room. Which means that God sees people in the temple, the priests who are doing the proper service in the temple. During temple times, there were times that we're doing proper service by the book A, B, C, D. Getting it, checking all the boxes, doing everything 100% the way that it's supposed to be done. And God looks at them and says, get thee out. Get out of my house. What do, you, what do you think? You think I want your sacrifices? So time and time again, you find in the prophets, God is saying to the prophets, to tell the Jews, I'm not interested in, in, in the fat of your goats. I'm not interested in that. I don't need that from you. Dominish this, as they say in Spanish. I don't need that. So it's not worship, okay? The purpose of the Torah is not worship either. We're getting to my favorite one. You ready for my favorite one? This is the best. God gave us a Torah so we could get Olam Haba. That's why Olam Haba or Olam Haba or Olam Haba or however you want to say it, the world to come, heaven. God gave us a Torah so that we could go to heaven. That's Islam, not the Torah. That's the Quran. It's a different book. I know they both have fancy cover, fancy cover, but they're not the same. They're very different. Do you know how I know that the point of the Torah is not to get Olam Haba? I, I know definitively. In fact, I would bet big dollars. How many big? Boom. Right? Right? I mean, can there be, can there possibly be a more clear proof than that? Right? How do you know, I mean, just to, to, to get political for 30 seconds, for 30 seconds to get political, you know why the Arabs shouldn't be in Israel? Because they don't want to be in Israel. It's not in their thing. It's not holy to them. It's not holy to them. It's a lie. They're, they're being too, it's not holy. How do you know it's not holy? Because how many times does it say Israel in the Quran? Zero! The same number of times it says Dearborn, Michigan. Same number of times. Same number of times it says Olympics. Same number of times it says New England Patriots. Same number of times it says Shlomo Michael Sprung. The answer is zero. I am tied for the world record of least number of times mentioned in the Quran right alongside Jerusalem. It's a fallacy. It's a fallacy. Now, Mecca, on the other hand, is very important to them. And so is Medina. Very important. You know how they're important? Because Muhammad talked about them a lot. A lot. It's a pretty decent indication that there's something there. Yes. Uh, to tell me, do Jews often talk about Israel? Oh, I don't know. 20 times a day for 3,000 years. You know, yeah. We, we, we have songs about it. And poems. And liturgy. They, and they don't. Okay, this, 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 again, this has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 
this is showing you the whole thing is bogus. It's bogus, okay? There's, there's agenda upon agenda upon agenda, but it, it has nothing to do with, with truth or reality. The point is that the Torah cannot possibly be about attaining the world to come because the Torah doesn't talk about the world to come. It doesn't spill one drop of ink about it. It doesn't. Oh, but it alludes to it. Okay, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist and I'm not saying it's not important. I'm saying it's not the point. It can't be the point if it doesn't talk about it. So what's the point? It's not morality and it's not holiness and it's not worship and service and it's not the world's come. <laughs> so what is it? What's the point? That's it, I'm done. I don't know how to answer it. Okay, so I would like to read to you from, this is really weird. I'm going to read to you, and again, you're not going to believe this because it's really weird. It's very strange. What I'm going to tell you is very, very strange. But, hey, it's a puzzle, so we're going to have to read it. Uh, it's on page 960 if you have the stone edition. It's in Parsha Va'et Hanan. It's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6? Yes, 6. We've definitely invoked this verse before in our travels together. Ushmartem va'asitem. And you shall guard it, and you shall do it. Kihi chokhmatchem uvinatchem le'inei ha'amim. Kihi, because it. What's it? It is doing and guarding the Torah. That's what Moses is talking about here. Because it is your wisdom and your understanding le'inei ha'amim. In the eyes of the nations. Asher yishmu'un. That they will hear all of these laws, and they shall say, What an amazing, grand, brilliant nation are these Jews. Moshe says, Why do you do the Torah? Why? Why should you guard and do the Torah? Well, because it is your brilliance in the eyes of the nations, because when they see what you do, they'll say, what an amazing nation. <laughs> Let me get this straight. The, the, the point of the Torah is, is what the, what the Goyim thing? <laughs> it's, it's crazy, right? That's crazy. But, but yeah, right? You know how I know it is? How, how do I know what then? How do I know it's the point? Why does everybody think the point would be anywhere else other than in the book? Why would you look for the point outside the book? Maybe it says what it means. It does. It says it. It's, it's very troubling, though, um, because we don't... I, I thought the Jews don't care what anyone else thinks. Isn't that what we're taught? Don't care what anyone else thinks, right? That's what we spend billions of dollars on our children's education, so they won't care what anybody else thinks. Isn't that why we do it? Mm. It's odd. Um, and in fact, in fact, it's even odder when you consider, you know, if God, if God is so obsessed with what all the nations think, you know, he could have given them the Torah. He didn't have, could have left us alone, frankly. Right? Could have left us alone. Pesach's really expensive. truth. And Sukkot is either very hot or very cold. Like the old fiddler line, right? God, I know you chose us, but can't you choose someone else sometimes? <laughs> Why didn't God just give them the flipping thing? It's a good question. Yeah. And especially when you consider that, you know, God didn't create Jews. When he created the world, and again, how do I know? Because I have the book and I read it. Yeah, go to page one. God creates man. He doesn't create Jew, right? No, he creates man. And then there's like ten generations, and there's another man who destroys the world, and you got this Noah dude with the ark. And then there's another ten generations, you get like Abraham. You're talking about thousands of years later. Abraham, according to our count, is born nearly 2,000 years after Adam. 1948, it's an easy date to recall. Okay, 19, Avram's born in 1948. 
from uh, after Adam is born. Nearly 2,000 years later. So for 2,000 years, you didn't have any Jews. And Avram's not the first Jew anyway. Avram's not the first Jew anyway. He's the prototype of Jews, but he's not the first Jew. How do I know he's not the first Jew? Because like we said, Judaism is the Torah, and he didn't get the Torah. Right? How do I know that? Because it says in the Gemara. Because the Talmud says it. I'm going to take a 48-second tangent for those of you who are sitting at home saying, screaming at the screen, saying, Sprung, you're an idiot, and you're wrong. I might be an idiot, but I'm not wrong. Um, the, the Gemara and Brachot says as follows. It, it, it darshans a pasuk. If you don't want to listen to this, just feel free to, to hit mute for 48 seconds. Um, the Gemara in Brachot says, it darshans the pasuk, Haske Sushma Yisrael Hayom Zen Yisrael which means uh, be quiet and listen, Jews. Today you became a nation. And the Gemara asks, that pasuk was given at the end of 40 years in the desert. So it says, was that the day that the Jews got the Torah? I thought that was at the end of 40 years. And the Gemara answers, well, because every day it should be as if it was today. That's wonderful. But you understand from the Gemara's question, from the question of the Gemara, you understand what the Gemara thinks is the definition of the Jews. Because the Gemara said, how could you say at the end of the 40 years in the desert that today you became a nation? That was not the day they got the Torah. Hmm. You can infer from that that the Talmud understands that the day that you became a nation was the day you received the Torah. Which in fact is also very intuitive philosophically because if you don't have one law that defines you, then you're just a bunch of people in the same place. That's not a nation. A nation is when everybody decides together what it is that defines them. That's very intuitive. This is, by the way, one of the, this is like a tangent on a tangent, but this is the, the major problem with our country right now. The major problem that's eating our country from the inside is the fact that we don't have one nation, one covenant, one idea, and one vision that says we are American. We don't look at ourselves that way. We have intersectionality, we have identity politics, we have I'm a this and you're a that. So I'm a, I'm a white, cisgender, uh, trans libertarian and you are a black hetero right this is all that's not a nation what are you talking about those are all those are all fallacies that's not how you define yourself as i say well no, i'm a redhead so I'm, I'm different what do you mean you're redhead so you're different red is not a category of people you're a person with red hair so but, uh, i digress let's get back to the to the main issue the, the main issue at hand is, according to the Talmud, you become a nation when you get the Torah. That's fine. So Avraham, even though he was the prototype of the nation, he was not the first Jew per se, he was the prototype that set the rock in motion that ended up, you know, snowballing it, etc., etc. So he was 2,000 years after Adam. Why couldn't God, like, create Jews? Why didn't he create Jews from the very, very beginning? And why didn't he give all the other people the Torah also? Why does he only give it to us? Now, the truth is I'm cheating. I'm cheating. And the reason I'm cheating is because the Talmud says that he did. It's crazy. I know. Wild. 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 But it says it. It says it. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Google it. That's more of what is are in the beginning of the first paragraph. Gimel. Google is Jugal. Jugal. Well, of course it's Jugal. Because <laughs> <laughs> isn't Sergei Brin Jewish? Um, yeah, uh, you, you may Jugal it, and you will find that in the very beginning of Masechet Abodasara, uh, on page 3, it says, and it, this is quoting a very, very famous midrash, that God, in fact, take your politics somewhere else. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, man. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. Yeah. Um, it says that God actually offered the other nations the Torah. Unbelievable. So here, I would like to quote for you what the midrash says, because this is a fascinating midrash. It says, you know, God went to the children of Esau, and he said to them, he goes, hey, guys, you want the Torah? And they say, Torah? Well, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, well, what's in it? Ma Kosuve, what's in it? He goes, well, uh, it says don't murder. Don't murder? We don't murder. Of course we murder. What do you mean? We, we can't not murder. That's ridiculous. No thanks. And God says, okay, fine. So he goes to the children of uh, Ammon and Moab. And he says, hey, want the Torah? And they said, Torah? Sounds good. What, what's in it? And he says, well, it says you're not allowed to commit adultery. No forbidden sexual relationships. And they say, what? No, that's ridiculous. We can't do that. That's crazy. How's that? We can't limit ourselves that way. Absolutely not. No thanks. Give it to somebody else. 
He goes, oh, okay. And so, you know, he's like a door-to-door vacuum salesman, you know, and he struck out twice. And then he goes to the, the Ishmaelites and he says to them, hey, guys, want the Torah? And they say, Torah sounds good. Sounds good. What's in it? And he says, well, it says can't steal. Can't steal? Can't steal? What do you mean can't steal? That's ridiculous. Take that somewhere else. And then, you know, the fourth guy in the block was the Jew. <laughs> right? He, Knocks on the Jew's door, they either want the Torah, and the Jew's like, is it free? I'll take two, right? And, and, the, and he says, uh, would you like the Torah? And the Jew says, Torah? Yeah, okay, I'll take it. Nasa Nishma. I'll do it, and I'll understand it later. He didn't even ask what's in it. And God's like, wow, this is great. I'll give it to them. Now, this is a very strange midrash for numerous reasons. Number one, when it says God went, God went and offered it to the Asavites and the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Ishmaelites. What does that mean, God went? <laughs> God went like he, he strapped up his Volvo and he flew down and he knocked on the door of the mosque and he's like, hey, Iman Perselovitz, would you like some Torah? I mean, like, what, what does that mean to you? That it, it's a strange, I, I, listen, just, it's a funny mental picture. I suggest that the next time you're drinking delicious kosher wine, you close your eyes and try to imagine what, what, the, what the Midrash is actually saying. But, but that, put, put that aside for a minute. There's a much more basic question, because that's a practical question, not a philosophical question. I like to deal with the philosophical questions. They're more fun. Uh, the philosophical question is, if you recall, each one of these nations had a reason as to why they didn't want the Torah. So this nation didn't want it because it says don't murder. And this nation didn't want it because it says no forbidden relationships. And this one didn't want it because it says no stealing. You know what the problem is? The problem is very, very simple. If you're not Jewish, do you have God's law? Does God's law still reign over you if you're not Jewish? I'll give you a hint. Yes. And how many laws do you have? Seven. Seven. Seven Noahide laws. The seven laws of Noah. So even if you're not Jewish, you still have laws. And the interesting part, the interesting part of these seven is that you know what laws they include? Can't murder. Can't have forbidden sexual relationships. Can't steal. So it doesn't help you. The Midrash makes no sense saying that the reason that these nations rejected the Torah was because it limited them from these things doesn't hold water. Because even if they didn't take the Torah, they're still limited by those things. They're already limited by those things. So what does the Midrash mean? That's very odd. How very odd. The other question, which again is a little bit of a head scratcher to me, why did the Jews take it without asking the question that everyone else thought was a good question, right? If someone comes and wants to sell you something, the first question you generally ask him is, what are you selling me? And I mean, any Jew would tell you that, that's for sure. What are you selling me? Here, the Jews are like, no, right? Because they trusted God. It's just so beautiful, right? Oh, they trusted God. It's so nice, right? That's so spiritual. It's so nice. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem very logical. I'll tell you what I think it means. I'll tell you what I think it means. You see, it's true that God says in the seven Noahide laws that you can't murder. That's true. That's okay. Who defines murder? I do. We would never murder. It's not murder. That's a political dissident. God says no forbidden sexual relationships. I agree, God. I would never. Oh, that? That's holy. We bless that. God says no stealing. I would never steal. I would never steal. What, his land? Now that land is forfeit. That's Hefker. You see, it's true that they're not allowed to murder and they're not allowed to steal and they're not allowed to commit adultery and all that stuff. That's all true. The problem is it doesn't help. Because as long as I'm holding the keys, what is murder? I'm golden. 
It's not, it's not murder if Congress signs the paper. It's not stealing if it should have been mine anyway. It's not adultery because we're supposed to be together. We love each other. That's the problem. The Torah is not like that. The Torah defines the parameters of these things. And they're outside of you. You don't control them. So let's think very carefully about what the Jews say. Because the Jews say these magic words, right? They say, Nase v'nishma. We will do and we will hear. Now, the, I think, conventional wisdom of understanding what this means is, first we'll do it and then afterwards we'll ask you why we're doing it, right? It's sort of like a show of trust. One of those uh, trust falls or something like that where you say, like, well, I trust you, so I'll fall first, you'll catch me later. God, I'll do it, I'll take it on credit. Right? You're saying you're basically extending God a lease of your Bugatti on credit. That's how people understand Nasa Vanishma. That's not what Nasa Vanishma means, obviously. That's not very impressive. Why wouldn't you trust Bill Gates on his credit? Why wouldn't you extend a Bugatti to Jeff Bezos on his credit? Big freaking deal. That doesn't make you a tzaddik. It makes you a half-decent businessman. That's not what Nasa Vanishma means. Nasa Vanishma means we will do, and after we do, it will make sense as to why we're doing it, but not before. And that's a tremendous understanding. Let me explain why. You see, people are funny. People are really funny. I don't mean the people you and I know. I mean every people, all the time. Throw a dart at a globe and throw a dart at a time lapse and it doesn't matter where and it doesn't matter when and it doesn't matter what the socioeconomic uh, situation of the time happens to be. This will be the case. Every generation grows up, looks at their parents, and says, you guys are wrong about this, 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 and this. And we're going to shift it. We're going to fix that. And then their kids grow up and say, mom, dad, you're wrong about this, 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 and this. And we're going to shift. And we're going to fix all those things. You know what everyone has in common? The world still sucks. Haven't fixed anything. Just as messed up as your grandmother. Why? Why? Because humans essentially live in a fishbowl. You exist here in this stupid little pixelated reality that you think is the world. And you think that whatever you happen to know is real and you can fix it. But it's not. It's not. You have this tiny myopic picture of reality. So you can look at your tiny myopic picture of reality and say this and that and that. I don't really, it doesn't add up to me. We're going we're gonna to fix that. So everyone now looks at their great-grandmother and says, you know, Grandma, she's a really, really nice gal, but, you know, she's, she's a racist. And Grandma looks at, at, at the kid and says, you know, yeah, that kid, you know, he seems to love a lot of people, but he has no respect, no honor, no work ethic. This is universally true. No one likes anyone else's music either, because music is a way of thinking, and we think differently. So you don't like the music anymore. It's the same thing. Society shifts. The problem is that no society is any better or any worse than any other society. And if you want to see, if you want to demonstrate how you can viscerally and primally experience how true this is, pick two random times, one from 400 years ago and one from 1200 years ago, and compare them and see which one is better. And they're like, neither is better. But they're both so far away from you, they're both equally ridiculous doesn't matter what two time periods you choose. You're going to have the same experience every time. You choose the year 850 and the year 850 BCE. And look at their societies and the ways that they lived. And you will find a million things wrong with all of them. Because of course you do. In your way. In the way that you think makes sense. But you know what? Our kids are going to find just as much fault in whatever we do. Of course they will. Our kids are going to call us Nazis. Our kids are going to call us Nazis. This is, I, I, we've spoken about this before, but like I, I have to voice it. This is the problem with revisionist history, right? We're taking down, we're going to rename this mountain, and we're going to rename that university. And why? Because I'm going to judge that person with the morals of today. How do you judge that person with the morals of today? He lived in a very different world where this, 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 and this were okay. And this, 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 and that were not okay. You're going to judge him? You're going to judge him? It's like, I think we should remove Winston Churchill's name from everything because he didn't have a fourth pronoun. Really? Do you understand how self-centered and wrapped up in your own stupid truth you have to be? The hubris of that? The hubris of that?
There was never a great man until yesterday. And it's me. That, 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 we live in that now. It's, it's, it's a terrible existence. At least in the old days, they had heroes. Now we have no heroes. Unless it's Kim Kardashian. She's a hero. <sighs> anyway, the point. The point is that you keep making these, these fixes to what the last generation did. <laughs> you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere. You're just, you're just moving. You're just moving. You have no direction. You have nothing. Why? Well, we now understand, we now have a better and more subtle understanding of this concept than ever before in history. In history. Because for the first time in history, we understand subtlety. Here's what I mean by that. If your algorithm is off by a decimal, how off are you? You're forever off. If your DNA is off by 0.00001, doctor, how far off are you? You're done. You're done. You're far off. If your computer code, if your football team, if your rotisserie league, if your accounting algorithm is off by this, everything is off. We now appreciate that in a way that we never did before because subtlety didn't matter nearly as much before as it matters now because we have the ability to measure it now. Now we see. Now we perceive how much tiny differences make. So now all of a sudden we understand that there's two things. There's perfect and there's not perfect. There are all sorts of degrees of not perfect. There are infinite degrees of not perfect. You could be imperfect here, imperfect here, imperfect there. There are so very many levels of imperfect, but there's only one perfect. And you're not going to intuit it on your own. <laughs> you're just not. You're not. Why not? Because you don't have all the data. All you have is what you saw with your parents and your own stupid meat brain. That's all you have. So God comes to the Jews and says, hey, want a book? And the Jews, what do they say? Listen to what they say! Nase. Finish ma. We'll do it. And then we'll hear it. I can't possibly hear it before I do it because it won't make any sense to me. Until I do it. Why won't it make any sense to me until I do it? What do you mean? Because I'm living in this reality. These ideas don't make any sense to me. These ideas are from a totally different reality. I'm living in this reality that was created by my parents and my crew and my the political ideals in this country, in this time. It's contrived. It's all contrived. How could you possibly intuit ultimate truth when you live in a fishbowl? Of course you can't. So if you live in Victorian England, you have every much, every bit as much a chance as if you lived in ancient Egypt of Ramses II, which is to say none. You have no chance, because you're limited. So the Jews look at God and say, we'll take it, and we'll do it. And after we do it, then it'll make sense. When we plug everything in, and we do it the way that you say, because you have all the data. So we're not going to define murder, because we understand that our definition of murder is lacking. And we're not going to define forbidden sexual relationships, because our definition is biased. And we're not going to define stealing, because our definition is skewed. We'll take yours, God, and we'll do it. And then after we do it, we'll understand it. Why will we understand it after we do it? What will all of a sudden be understood? Well, if you do the entire Torah, if the Torah is the algorithm for perfection, then if you did it, what would you see? Perfection. And then you'd understand why you're doing it, wouldn't you? Because you'd see the product. Um, so, fascinatingly, but not ironically at all, if you look through the Torah, you have numerous times blessings and curses. If you do this, you'll get this, and if you do that, you'll get that. And you know what's really, really interesting about it? See, if you look through the other religions, if you do this, you go to Valhalla. And if you do this, you go to hell. And if you do this, you go to heaven. And if you do this, you go to that great Egyptian pyramid in the sky. And if you do this, all these things that happen after you die. But as my friends will tell you, what does the Torah promise? 
What is the total power? This one. Exclusively. Repeatedly. Ad nauseum. Do this, and you know what you'll get? You'll have no war. You'll have no famine. You'll have no strife. You'll have no miscarriages. You'll have no infighting. Now, what does that sound like to you? This is, this is like an Oprah fantasy. This isn't a, this isn't a religious book. No, 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 that's, that's the total. Read it! That's what it says. What's the point of the Torah? The point that it says. Perfect society. Perfect society. God gave you a gift. He gave you a gift. He gave you existence. In, in literally, like, unbelievable. I, I, I'm a fan of Alice in Wonderland because I'm a little crazy. And, and I think sometimes, but like through the looking glass, you know, can you imagine you go down the rabbit hole and it's like, oh, there's cotton candy on the wall and there's like oh, they cats smoking hookahs and caterpillars and like really, really cool, right? Um, and, but we live in Wonderland. We live in Wonderland. You, 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 you go to Disney and you think to yourself, wow, this is really, really cool. No, no, Disney doesn't touch a candle to Miami Beach. But we don't live in Disney. This world is amazing, and God puts you here, and it's so funny. It's so funny because you think, oh, there's so much trouble in the world, right? So many problems, and so many problems in the world. The world is terrible. The world sucks. No, mm -mm. you suck. The world is great. The world is amazing. You know what would have to change in the world to be perfect? Nothing. Only you. You! You need to change! The world is great! The mountains don't need to go away. The sea doesn't have to change. The weather is great. The, the world? He gave you flipping Wonderland and he stuck you in it and he goes, Enjoy! Have fun! And instead, what, what, what do we do? Killing each other, fighting with each other, jealous of each other, stealing from each other. It's all self-inflicted. It's literally self-inflicted. This is, again, this is a thought that I've, that I've said numerous times because I, I'm a fan of history and, and the, the, the worst, I think the worst period of time for humanity as a whole was World War I in the trenches. And, and, and you, know, you get this, you read about it, it's, it's, it's horrific. Um, and, and you have this, this, this trench, right, with Frenchmen and Englishmen, and they're sitting there, and, and 200 yards over there, there's a German trench, and the, and the Frenchmen and the Englishmen are sitting down there, and they're covered in mud and soot and death and reek. And they're praying to God, and they're saying, God, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. And 200 yards that way, there's a German trench. And the Germans are covered in soot and dirt and death and reek. And they're praying to God and they're crying and they're saying, God, make it stop, make it stop, make it stop. And God's like, what, what do you want from me? Stop. Stop. <laughs> did, I, did, I, did I dig that trench? Did I stick you in that hole? You stuck you in that hole. You. You do everything to yourselves, don't you see? You know what the point of the Torah is? It's the answer to the matrix. It's in the matrix. Morpheus is sitting there with Agent Smith. I'm sorry to get all geeky on you. <laughs> and Agent Smith says, you know, we tried to make a utopia for you guys, but you all died. You don't like utopia. Well, because he doesn't know how to design utopia. He can't get the balance right. God says, you want utopia? Here it is. Here it is. Do this. You'll see, I promise. Try me. Try me. I said, well, I, well, I can't. Uh, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. That doesn't make any sense. Of course it doesn't make any sense to you! Oh my God, this is unbelievable. Do you understand the assumption? The assumption in that statement is that, well, I read the Torah, and there were, there were many things that I liked about it. There were many things that I liked about it. It was very nice. But there were 28 things, and I have them here. Here's my list. And I put it, I, I, I nailed it on the door like Luther. And there were 28 things in the Torah that I didn't like. For you to read the Torah and agree with everything in it, that means you are God. Of course you didn't like 28 things. You're not calibrated, idiot. You're 
you're living in your particular bubble, in your particular bubble. In this bubble, slavery is bad and eating veal is bad. And in this particular bubble, slavery is good and selling your daughter is wonderful. And in this bubble, we don't wear leather pants, but we eat, we, we eat lobster. Of course it doesn't make any sense to you. <laughs> That's gotta say, do it. Nasa the Nishma, do it, you'll see. Do it, do it. Do it, I keep trying, I'm begging you guys, I'm begging you guys. He's sitting up there for millions of years, he's saying, God, kids, kids, it's unbelievable. Anyone who's taken a road trip with their children, right? if you've taken, this is God, I'm convinced. Okay, I have a God complex, because every time I take a road trip to Orlando, I'm God, because I'm sitting there in the front, I'm sitting there in the front, and we become our parents, right? It's unbelievable. And, and like your kids are in the back, and they're fighting. And they're angry at each other. Very, and not my kids. My kids are perfect. But I, I, I saw a movie once um, about Chevy Chase's kids. And they're, they're bad kids. And, and they're, they're arguing, right? And what are you thinking in the front seat? What are you thinking as a father? You're like, what the hell's the matter with you? We're going to Disney. I'm driving you to freaking Disney in a beautiful... There's air conditioning in the car. Do you understand what air conditioning is? Do you understand what air conditioning is? You're sitting in the car. You're like, mm, nope, too hot. Beep. Don't like it? Click. Literally, you control the weather on leather seats. Leather seats. Don't like it? There's a moonroof. You can in the moonroof. You have you have CDs. Each of you has a flipping iPad. How could you possibly be fighting? You're in your own time pod. That's God. That's God. God is looking at us, and He's like. What the hell's the matter with these people? I put you in Wonderland. I gave you everything here. Here it is. Here it is. Take it. Take it. Please do it. You'll love it. You'll love it. It'll be amazing. Do you understand we have not begun to scratch? To scratch the awesomeness in the world? Wonderful. NASA, right? They're, they're discovering billions and billions of light years. Away. Galaxies. Do you know why the galaxies are there? For us. For us. You could spend a lifetime studying caterpillars, dung beetles, trees. And that, that's like right here. That's like local. That's on your block. You could spend a lifetime. You get three doctorates in, in horticulture. And you haven't even left the atmosphere. We have infinity. And who's holding us back? Some guy in an ugly suit in North Korea. <laughs> this is so unbelievable. Ourselves. We do it, we do it for ourselves. You know, what, what's the point of Torah? Enjoy Wonderland. That's the point. Enjoy Wonderland. Love it. Enjoy it. I made it for you. I don't need it. I'm good. I don't, I don't need the fat of your goats. I don't need you to throw blood at the wall. It doesn't do anything for me. I don't need your worship. Oh, you want to be holy, a religious person? I don't like religious people. They blow people up. Just, just enjoy life. Have an amazing life. Make a perfect society. Cure hunger. Cure famine. Cure disease. Cure bad relationships. Cure competition. Cure jealousy. Cure anger. You can cure all these things. Here, here it is. Do it. Why do I think that's the point? Because it says it in the book! So, but why do you give it to the Jews? Why not everybody? I says, well, no, no, I tried to give it to everybody. I, I tried. To, see, see, the world isn't for Jews. The world is not for Jews. God didn't create Jews. The world is for man. The world is for people. He says, but you know, people. Oh, I got people. People. They're so disappointing. People. People, they, they have to just get their heads screwed on straight. Well, I got this one really stiff neck people, and they're not much better. They're not that good either. In fact, it's right here in the book. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's Mama's right here, where Moses is like, and don't think that you're so good, and that's why God did this for you, because you suck. This is what Moses says in the book. You know why he says it? Because it's true. Jews? Not, not, not very special either. Um, you know what they have though? That, that's very good. They're very stubborn, stiff-necked. That's what Torah says, stiff-necked. Am kishay Stiff-necked. Why stiff-necked good? I'll tell you why stiff-necked good. 
Because God's like, look, here's the deal. I'm going to give you the manual, and I need to give the manual to people who will never, ever, ever go away. Who's the only people in the world that never, ever, ever go away? Jews. Am Kishay Oreth. Am Kishay Oreth. Unbelievable. You'll never give it up. I know you guys. You'll never give it up. You won't get it right either. You're going to screw it up again and again and again and again and again and again and again. But that's okay. Eventually, a billion years from now, you'll get it right. What's getting it right look like? That the whole world looks at it and says, Oh, look at that. Unbelievable. You're telling me we could have a country with no natural resources? Really? You're telling me we can cure hunger without oil? You're telling me we can clothe the naked without gold in the mountain? You're telling me you can have a perfect society with no water? Mm -hmm, that's what I'm telling you. That's exactly what I'm telling you. So Moshe turns to the people and he says, And you shall guard it and you shall do it. Why? Because this is your wisdom in the eyes of the nations. You gotta fix the whole world. The whole world you gotta fix. First you gotta fix yourself. Then you can fix the whole world. How do you fix it? Yishmark Ken Vasi said. Guard it and do it. Peace and love, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great week and a great job. See you next week.